Welcome to the show. I'm Doug Johnson, and each month we highlight a person who has something to say, someone who knows a strategy for life success. Today's guest is amazing to me. His name is Stefan Stoyanovich, mm -hmm. and he is a young millennial who has probably accomplished more in his few years than many people accomplish in a lifetime. Stefan, thanks so much for being here. Pleasure is mine. Thank you for having me, Doug. So, you and I go back for only a couple of years, but I feel like I've known you for a lot longer than that. I've always been fascinated by what you've done, what you've accomplished, and obviously there is a beginning to the story. So would you share that with our guests, please? What What is your backstory? Sure. Again, thank you for, for having me on the show and you know mentioning that um, you feel like we go back even further. That's what happens when you drink with somebody. You, you just <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> you can't avoid it. But um, I'm a right now I'm a mortgage banker. Um, came to United States seven years ago, at the time as a high school student, um, and then worked my way up. I guess the beginning of the story comes with my background, where I'm from. Um, originally, I'm from Serbia, a small country in southeastern Europe, uh, former Yugoslavia. And uh, I grew up there, um, mom, dad, two sisters, and grandma. Um, mom and dad have their own business. My sisters are accomplished basketball players. Uh, our grandma makes lunch, dinner, and breakfast. <laughs> uh, and, and obviously, she lives with us in the household. Um, and then, you know, we all played basketball. Um, Dad played basketball when he was uh, young, semi-professionally. Um, and then he got us into basketball from early age. We always followed him around when he would go to play with, with his friends. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we got to a point where we all wanted to accomplish something in basketball. Um, at the age of 13, I met this guy called Mladen Mrkajic. He actually studied at Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you a, a quick story where I was playing basketball in the local playground. It, it's between the, um, a bunch of high, tall buildings, um, like um, co-ops in New York, approximately. Mm -hmm. But in the middle, they would always have a playground right. where kids would play. And um, I was pretty old. The economy there is not so strong, so there was a half a backboard missing. Uh, the rim didn't have a net, and I was there shooting basketball. And it's funny how that sounds now, but at the time, here comes this guy wearing like a fancy jersey and Jordan basketball shoes and a leather basketball where I played with a rubber ball that if it was too cold outside, it deflated. Um, and so he came up and he's coming over and starts shooting. And to me as a 13-year-old kid, I was like, Holy smokes, like, what? Some, somebody who's, he's, is he an NBA player? Who is uh -huh, he? Uh -huh. So he was shooting, he asked me to pass him the ball, um, and over the course of the next week or so, he would come out uh, to practice every day, and I just passed him the ball. But I'd ask him a question or two, and I learned a little bit about this guy. Well, he studied at Rhodes University in Memphis, Tennessee, um, had a full ride scholarship for basketball, and that was, that was his main story he got to United States as an exchange student. Now, towards the end of that period while he was in Serbia, my family and I went to the seaside in Montenegro. And when we got back 10 days later, um, upon return, I went to the backyard because we would always hide the keys of the house and in the backyard underneath one of the stones. Uh -huh. I went to pick it up and I saw a white bag. And I looked at it and I grabbed it and there was a basketball, the Rollings leather basketball in it and uh, Jordan shoes. Um, and I thought to myself, I know whose these are, or at least I, I'm pretty sure I know whose they are, but did he just forget them here? Did he just um, had to go somewhere and then hit them in our backyard because we're close by so that somebody doesn't snatch it? Um, and, and then I, but nobody ever came for them. And I asked around if he's still around, and they said, no, he went back to the United States. So I thought, holy smokes, like, was this left for me, or, or, or did he just forget them? But I'm taking them, they're mine. Uh -huh. And I told my parents at that time that when I grow up, when I get to the age for um, appropriate for college, I will go to the United States. This was at the age of 13. I'd go to school, I'd tell my friends, um, 
they used to call me the American boy and, and make fun of me for that. <laughs> and, and at one point, to avoid them calling me the American boy, I said, yeah, I already signed a contract. There was no contract. There was none of that stuff uh, except the idea of this is what I'm passionate about. Mm -hmm. This is what I want. And I saw somebody who portrays a great image to me, and I'm just going to do whatever they did. Um, it's kind of like a role model. Over the course of the next four years, I got in touch with, uh, with Madden. He actually told me that he did leave those for me. Mm -hmm. um, that was his gift and kind of like um, a pointer of, you know, follow your dreams. Right. And I found the agency. My parents separated about $5,000 at the time to pay for the agency to send me to the United States for one year as a high school exchange student. Um, and I came to the United States, and, and the rest was just following, following the dreams. And a, a course, of course, along the line, those dreams have changed. At times, they were to play basketball. Mm -hmm. Then they switched to get into finances more, because that's what I studied in school. And today, they are to grow as a leader. Um, one thing is for sure, everything changes around us. But I've always had some sort of goal that I followed. That was the path that I took to just get to the United States. Mm -hmm. Uh, for the rest of the story, I guess then um, I was told that I need to find a full ride scholarship because the education here is a lot more expensive. In Serbia, um, it costs nothing to go to school. You actually, if you're a good student, mm -hmm. you're, the, the education is paid uh, and you actually get scholarships off the top of the um, fact that the education is paid. Um, and here, you know, anywhere from 20,000 to 60,000 a year, right. depending on where you want to go to school. <coughs> so I applied to 25 colleges and universities along the United, uh, in the United States, mm -hmm. all over the place. Um, I designated them. I found which ones have free application. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then I got accepted into 21, some of them as, as famous as Colgate University in mm -hmm. New York, sure. um, some small schools um, like Shawnee State down in southern Ohio, as well as, as um, here, Lake Erie College, and financially, and from from financial perspective, um, Lake Erie made the most sense. Also, from perspective of like, the best campus among the the colleges that gave me full ride scholarships. Right. Um, the scholarship was not for basketball; it was all academic, and I enrolled at Lake Erie. Um, I played there basketball for a couple of years. Came to realization that while that dream is something that I'm passionate about, um, I'm I'm not as good as as I wish to be, mm -hmm. or as good as um, to see the path of, of making a lot of money through it, or just being successful at it enough to be able to afford a, a nice living. Um, and that's that's where, where you met me. I enrolled into being a distiller. Right. So I started working for my professor, Tom Licks, at Cleveland Whiskey. Uh, my first job was to clean the floors and roll the barrels as an internship. Um, to to do a little bit of research on the side, and through a couple of years, I progressed into a brand ambassador. Right. Um, got better at speaking in front of people in public, and then you and I met at Scott's restaurant down in Twinsburg when I was right. doing a presentation mm -hmm. on on Cleveland whiskey. Um, that story obviously goes on, and, and Cleveland whiskey continues to work hard, uh, but I've since changed careers. Um, Cleveland Whiskey has gone through some financial changes on, on their front end, and at the time I was offered a all commission position, or um, I would have to find a better opportunity. Right. And since I didn't have any savings aside, I had just graduated from college that year. I said, you know what, I have to find something where um, I'll be able to make a better income than just all commission, because I won't be able to pay the rent for the next few months. And I did find that. Um, I decided to apply to Quicken Loans. Mm -hmm. It took four months before I got hired, um, and and instead of them calling me like like we do at Quicken Loans for our people who we recruit, I kept calling them. And at one point, they had to say, "All right, we'll we'll bring you in." <laughs> <laughs> so um, I started working there. I've been there for two years now as a as a mortgage loan officer, and uh, I continued to grow. I think the main thing that you and I talked about earlier was. It's only been seven years. Mm -hmm. And so now, when I turn around, knowing that I just came as a high school student, as, as one of the kids you see walking on the street, going to school, and coming back from school, and, and serving their purpose of having breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and watching TV for three or four hours a day, that's who I was. And today, I've, I've made a lot of progress, and 
I think the best part about it is this is just the start. There is, there is a lot more potential that I see within myself and around me to accomplish more success. So what are your life goals? I haven't defined all of them very strictly as to this is what I have to make or this is what I have to make. But uh, I think the main thing is that I want to be happy um, with what I do. I want to have a 40-year career where I wake up on a Monday and, and I go to work with purpose and I come back home and I enjoy the rest of my, my life. Here in the United States, we, now we, it used right. to be you, but now yes. we, we live in a culture where um, a lot of things are, are dedicated to work. People in the United States work more than people overseas. Mm -hmm. My dad's day, who's a self-employed businessman, starts at maybe 7 or 8 a.m. He's done about 2.33 p.m. He gets home. We're, lunch is the big meal at Serbia, so mm -hmm. uh, we all have lunch. Then he goes, takes his nap. Then he wakes up, then he goes, plays basketball, comes back home, has maybe a beer or two, watches TV for a little bit, and then he goes to bed. And, and that, for example, was what I always envisioned as work-life balance. Well, and I, I really like that work-life balance. Right, he does too. But, but here you wake up at 7, you're at work by 9, you work till 5, Oftentimes in different places you work till six, seven. Mm -hmm. By the time you get home, because not everything is five minute distance, you get home, it's already eight o'clock. What do you do? You eat dinner because that's the big meal mm -hmm. and you go to bed. So people oftentimes complain about there's not enough work-life balance, especially when you work for some of the bigger corporations that are production driven. Right. So so finding the the getting out of the rat race and, and having enough streams of income where I'm not afraid for income, and finding the, the balance of, of what I do to be enjoyable. So even if I'm there from nine to seven, I'm happy with it, is one of my ultimate, ultimate personal um, business and success goals. Mm -hmm. Now you studied entrepreneurship at Lake Erie College. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> How do you see that figuring into this whole plan of not being a workaholic, if you will, but of having a work-life balance? Uh, it goes down back to definition of what's the work-life balance. Mm -hmm. um, so at Quicken, we work from 9 to 7 p.m. That's your regular work. And you're commission paid. And if you're not hitting your goals, what do you do? You go into work on weekends. For example, I told my director the other day, hey, you know, I'm going to, to um, be on a, on a show and I'm going to record this with uh, with Mr. Doug so I just want you to know that I'm not going to be at work from 9 to 11. A lot of places you don't have the ability to do so. Mm -hmm. You have to you have to schedule it out. You have to right. say can I? And and so the life and work the life and work today are are mixed up. In the middle of the day if I feel like calling Jody and and talking to her, I pick up my phone whether it's a business phone or my cell phone and I call her and I speak with her. So I think <sighs> Being studying entrepreneurship and looking to be an entrepreneur and start businesses in the future, mm -hmm. and being in a corporate America right now and working a job that requires a lot of hours put in, there is never going to be that life work balance where it's a clean separation. You just have to live it all. You live it all together, and, and you find happiness throughout it. So, to mix it up, we decided we're going to do um, once a quarter a trip. Mm -hmm. So last quarter we went to Niagara Falls. Uh, the quarter before that we went to Washington DC. This December we're going to go to Chicago. Um, and we do a long weekend. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Right. And we have fun. Mm -hmm. So, so th there's your, your life and work balance. You, you make it. You don't expect somebody else to make it for you. One of the things as a millennial, Stefan, you and I have talked about this. Yep. Um, one of the <clears throat> generalities or generalizations about millennials is that they have no work ethic. And my take on it is, yes, they do, you do. Um, it's just different from someone like me, a boomer. Right. Um, it's different. So can you address um, what is work ethic to you? Okay. And in our discussions, we've talked about um, the joy of living, the joy of having a good time and enjoying life. How does that all fit together? So, that's a, that's a lot in that question right there. Um, 
I guess I'm driven by the work ethic because uh, in my family, the way we grew up, mm -hmm. the way we were raised, there was always a competition. Um, I have two younger sisters, but they're only one year younger than me. One plays basketball for Serbian national team. Mm -hmm. So it was always like she was always the top in basketball and, and all three of us played basketball. The other one, my dad has his own business, so we would always re be required to go and help. Eva was the best in helping at work. She knows ins and outs of, of everything that my dad does at work and, and how to handle it. So when he goes on a vacation, Eva takes over the company at the age of, she used to do that from the age of 18. Mm -hmm. She would take over the whole business, go and make sure that people are spread out and do what they need to do to make sure that things get done at the end of the day. And for me, I was always the best in school. So there was always a competition and it created a work ethic behind each thing because we would compete. I would also try to be uh, like Eva and, and help out and know more about business. Mm -hmm. um, I tried to be like Emilia. My goal was basketball and that was a, a lot of my passion. And they do the same to, to try and follow my track in education and, and get better and be a better, better students. Um, so the work ethic gets built from ground up. Um, the, the, the good news is that the world is ever changing, right? Right. So I think, I don't think millennials are, are lazy. I, I think they just, like you said, have a different, different type of work ethic. You know, you and I talked about it earlier where you said, all right, so um, my generation wouldn't turn around and say, look, I'm just going to move to California and figure it out from there. Right. You said, I first had to have a job. Mm -hmm. And a degree, then a job, everything had its own order. And, and somebody can say, well, I guess you just weren't courageous enough to take the bull by the horns and say, all right, whatever happens, happens. Mm -hmm. Let's get burned or, or, or make it a fame. Um, each has its advantages and disadvantages. Can you imagine what is it going to be like 50 years from now? What work environment or work ethic is going to look like if there is um, AI, artificial intelligence? Mm -hmm. I saw a video on Facebook the other day where in Switzerland they made a pair of hands that if you place different foods in front of this pair of hands, they will create a meal for you to really? chef's quality. Whoa. So can, you, can you imagine, like right now we find it difficult to cook and, and we go and get takeout from, from Longhorn or whatever other place mm -hmm. you have nearby. Can you imagine having a personal robot, robot chef that's preparing your, your foods? How That's is that going amazing. to? But but how is that going to affect our our work ethic mm -hmm. or or what we want? I don't know. I don't know. I don't think we're going for worse. It just has to change. We always have to find some balance between how much work we do, how much income we bring in, what kind of lifestyle do we have? Mm -hmm. Millennials are, are happy with their lifestyle, even though they might not be working as hard as uh, as boomers did, right? Right. So. Talking about working hard and, and all that, Stefan, when you get up in the morning, what? Why do you get up? What what drives you? What what is your motivation? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I, I guess another thing that, <clears throat> and I just thought about this well, yesterday. I woke up yesterday and it's Monday, and I'm thinking to myself, <sighs> I just had a great weekend. I'm, I'm dreading this Monday. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a whole week of work, right? And then I thought, <clears throat> that's not a fair trade. I'm about to trade five days of hard work. Just can't wait to have those two days of weekend. Um, if I were to give you $2 and say, or I'll give you two if you give me five back, would you take that trade? No deal. No deal, right? Right. So, so why do we do that on, on a daily basis? And I think it's all in here. It's all in your head. Now, how do you perceive life? How do you perceive that work? How do you, are you self-motivated? What is the why, your mm -hmm. goals behind things? Are you looking at things from a positive or negative perspective? And so I had to turn around and say, all right, I, I can't look at this, I'm dreading Monday. I have to look at this as, what are the fun things that are gonna happen today? So yesterday was Monday, I thought, okay, we have basketball, we have intramural basketball at, at Quicken, and mm -hmm. we're gonna play at the arena. And we played where LeBron James plays. Right. That was cool. Pretty cool, yeah. And then I thought, great, I went to Costco this weekend, and I still have two steaks left for dinner. Uh -huh. So I'm going to be grilling some steaks tonight when I get back home. Tomorrow, I'm going to be recording a show with Doug and, and go to the gym in the evening. And on Wednesday, 
I think my father-in-law is going to come up. Uh, we just bought a, a truck for Jody, and, and he's going to bring that up. There is always a positive in the day. Mm -hmm. You just have to find it. And the same thing goes for work. To be a mortgage banker is very monotone, very boring. You talk about the same thing every day. I, uh, I would be very miserable if I didn't break jokes with my clients on the phone. My clients love working with me because I, I'll joke. Mm -hmm. Plus, I have an accent, so it's even funnier <laughs> when you hear that. Um, <laughs> but what, what, I, what I think uh, drives me is the fact that I also love financial industry. So I don't look at myself as a salesman who comes in day in and day out to sell a few mortgages to earn a few bucks. I look at myself as somebody who, who has um, superior financial knowledge to, unfortunately, majority of the United States, even though I'm only 25. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I use that to help people reconstruct their, their finances from a perspective of a mortgage, because that's what I do as a job, where Jody is a physical therapist, right? Maybe she doesn't like necessarily uh, fixing broken legs all day long mm -hmm. and, and doing that every single day. But she likes the fact that she can see a progress in, in helping somebody recover. Right. She likes to see when somebody says, holy smokes, that, that right there that you just fixed, it feels so much better, I can lift my arm up. And, and that is the, the motivating factor. You just have to be focused on that instead of getting wrapped up in the everyday negative things that unfortunately we're surrounded by more than positive things. Right, right. Stephanie, you've given us um, a couple of tips, and I'll read one off to you and, and tell me what they mean to you and how you came up with these, basically. Um, and we, we've kind of referred to this a little bit during our conversation, but life is good when you take ownership of it. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> you, you pulled up this from Facebook, and uh, I, I can appreciate the research that you've done. You did a good research. They, some of them will date back when I was still in high school. Mm -hmm. So uh, I didn't know necessarily what I was talking about, <laughs> but they're, they're all good in itself, and, uh -huh. and they all come from. I spend a lot of time reading. I, I spend thirty minutes driving to work and back, and that's great time to listen to an audio book. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I listen to jazz, but at most times I listen to audio books. The first one that you just read, "Life is Good When You Take Ownership from It," it comes from Extreme Ownership. It's a book about Navy SEALs and and how they do things in life, um, and you know, you just. I, how many people can, can you blame for certain things that happen to you d during the day? Probably a lot. If there are negative things, there's always somebody who you can blame. Or you can take the ownership yourself uh -huh. and empower yourself. Okay. You empower yourself to make daily decisions, to be in control of your life. And when you do so, you can't blame anybody else for, for things. So it's more difficult to look at things from negative perspective. You can't even, if you're religious, you can't even blame God for it. <laughs> you take the ownership of your life. Um, it allows you to achieve more success. It allows you not to um, not to stop yourself um, and, and say, I wasn't able to do that. It just allows you to push yourself beyond what you thought was possible. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. How about never give up on something you can't go a day without thinking about? I, I wrote that. When I was my first year in the United States, I was living down in Chukothi as a high school student, and uh, I wrote it as uh, pertaining to basketball, because I would wake up at, at 7 a.m. Mm -hmm. My uh, host brother was a coach for a basketball team there, and I would actually go every morning um, with him to the gym before the school even started just to shoot. And at one point, I didn't have any scholarships, or, or I, I've gotten scholarships, but nothing that was getting me where I needed to be. Mm -hmm. I didn't have anything that was only $4,000 a year until literally May, uh, where I was, it was a deadline to say, are you going to right. that school or not? Mm -hmm. um, so at that time, I was just inspired to say, never give up on something you can't go a day without. And uh, four days before, um, I was actually supposed to give my final, uh, which school do you go to? I finally received an offer that I can accept from a financial standpoint. Nice. It came to the final 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 days. Right down to the line. My mom but, and dad thought I was believed. gonna come back yeah. My mom and dad thought I was coming back home. Mm -hmm. My mom was actually disappointed that that I got the offer because after a year of being away from home she thought, Holy smokes, if he gets this, there is another four years. Uh-huh. So 
Okay. One more. Work will win when wishing won't. Yeah. <laughs> work works. Work works. You can wish for everything in life. You can have ideas. But if you don't back it up, uh, if you don't back it up on the stage, what's the point? You can only wish. Right. You can only wish. What is your best strategy? In life? Mm -hmm. I mean, these, these three that you brought up as, as quotes, they, they're good ones, but I'd say just focus on, on making sure that, that you live a good life, um, but don't take things that you have around you for granted, right? Focus, focus on living a good life. Focus on, on enjoying um, things that you want to enjoy and, and focus on taking your trips mm -hmm. and being lazy when you need to be lazy. But don't take for granted the opportunities you have around yourself. Don't think that they're always going to be there. So take Stephen, them away. I, I think that is absolutely a great place to leave it because that is very, very insightful. Just came up with it. <laughs> and you are so smart, I'll tell you what. Thank you so much for being here. Really enjoyed it. I'm sure our, our audience will get much from, from the show. I hope so. Thank you so, for having me. You bet. Work ethic, millennials, boomers, Xers. We all think that work ethic is associated only with boomers, with the older generation. Well, folks, I have news for you. The Xers and the Ys, the millennials, also have a work ethic. Now, it's not like ours. You know, we always went to work early, worked late. There was no work-life balance. The millennials today are almost virtually opposite that. They believe that work balance, work-life balance is very, very important. And so what do they do? They ask for flexible hours. They ask for other benefits that reflect that work-life balance. So do the millennials have work ethic? Absolutely. It's just different from ours. And you know what, folks? I kind of like it.